All right. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the end of October. I can't believe the month is already gone. And here's our next multi cloud happenings. Thank you so much for joining us today. I really want to thank Suzanne and Paul for uh, really working on this content for you because we're really excited to bring to you develop and deploy microservices with Oracle Database at Azure and at Google Cloud. So next slide, Paul. And so here's our expert today. My name is Tammy Bednar, and I'm a product manager, and I focus on our Exadata database services, our base database services, and multi-cloud as well. And with us today is Suzanne. Hey, Suzanne. Hey, Tammy. And Paul. Paul is really the, the brains behind all of this content that we're going to hear today about developing these microservices. So I'm all excited about hearing about it. I hope you are too. Hey, Paul. Hey, happy to be here. Thank you. All right, next slide, please. Okay, we always have to put this in because we're product managers and you can't write anything we say into a contract, basically. And, you know, we try to follow the general outline. Sometimes we will give you some things that maybe is for informational purposes only. So anyway, I just have to say that. Okay, next slide. <laughs> All right, so today, as I said, we're gonna talk about developing and deploying microservices with Oracle Database at Azure and Google Cloud. And I think this is a really important topic because in fact, I was just talking to um, a customer and a sales team today about modernizing applications. And I think this is very important because re the remark I said is, applications that run on-premises are totally different than applications that run in the cloud. And I'm really excited for Paul to share that with us because I think this is a good thing to understand that, you know, I've been involved with the on-premises um, hardware, the deployment of databases and applications for many, many years. And going to the cloud, there's a little bit more involved in order for it to work properly with the cloud. So that's why I'm really excited about this topic today. Okay, next slide, Paul. So let's talk about multi-cloud development first. Okay, next slide. And this is the great thing I love about these multi-cloud solutions that Oracle has been talking about. I know it started a little bit over five years ago when we talked about Azure partnership and the interconnect, but we have moved up the game plan, quite honestly. And we're moving into fo uh, uh, supporting um, all the major uh, hyperscalers today that is providing you choice. That's the number one thing that I'm really excited about this multi-cloud solution is it allows you to run the workloads where you want them, where you need them, with the applications that you want. So that's why I'm really excited about these solutions as we move forward. Um, I think that um, we would love to hear from you to get your feedback as well, but that's what I'm really excited about is giving you that choice. Now, the cloud services that are available within these multi-cloud solution, uh, one is the Exadata database service, dedicated, this is where you get the hardware is all dedicated to you, where you provision VM clusters and then provision databases and VM clusters. And then the second choice that you have for database cloud service is the autonomous database serverless. And the autonomous database serverless uh, provides another level of automation when it comes to your databases um, so that you don't have to worry about some of the manual tasks that you've looked at all these years and be able to focus on this application development and your data and your customers yourself to really move your business forward. So these are the two services that were that um, have been that we've been working on for the past year, the at Oracle database at Azure and the Oracle database at Google Cloud. OK, with that, I think I'll turn that over to Suzanne so we can get into the meat of this presentation. So go ahead, Paul. Next slide. Thanks, Sammy. So like Pamie said, it's it's really exciting opportunity for us because for the first time we're delivering our hardware into your chosen uh, cloud provider's uh, data center. And with the, what this presentation is going to be about is developing microservices. So you're going to be looking at possibly developing with Azure Kubernetes service uh, on Microsoft and how we can actually enable that from a full stack development from end to end. Next slide, please, Paul. 
Similarly, with Oracle Database at Google Cloud, um, which uh, became available in, during Oracle Cloud World, um, we also have the opportunity now to, again, deliver the hardware, the Exadata infrastructure, which underpins Oracle Exadata Database Service and Autonomous Database, and for the first time, deliver Autonomous Database and Exadata, as well as RAC, whether you're developing on Azure or Google, uh, for your applications to run against. So you may want to be developing with J GKE, the Google Kubernetes Engine. And again, this is, presentation is really going to tell you how we can actually develop the microservices to modernize your applications. Or maybe you want to actually just do, from a grassroots up brand new uh, project, start developing with microservices and uh, implement that as well in Google and Azure. Next slide, please, Paul. So this multi-cloud full stack deployment, the reason why we've just put this that is in just to really show the end-to-end -end development. So our multi-cloud strategy, the heart of it is really to provide you top choice, as Tammy said, and to use the rich features of the Oracle database service when developing, whether that's with AKS or with GKE. And a full stack development is enabling to you to build and work on both the front end, the client side and the back end server side with components, say on mobile or web applications. So you as a full stack developer, you're going to have a full comprehensive understanding of how different components of these applications integrate and work. And Today, we're actually going to focus on the microservices and the elements of the database that we can use with, you know, to actually integrate all this uh, logic into it and deliver something that's very, very special and, and differentiating for you as a customer, which is most important. Next slide, please, Paul. So with that said, uh, let's just briefly talk about the Oracle database because Paul is really going to be talking about development here. And what we want to show you is how we can really bring the microservices development to you with the um, Oracle database features. So here in this slide, you can see we've highlighted microservice support, AI vector search, because we're going to be talking later about how we bring that in as well. So Paul, towards the end, will be showing a little bit about Oracle backend development for microservices and AI too. So the Oracle 23 AI really is game changing because it's it delivers architectural simplicity, but also scalability for data centric applications. And we talk a lot about this converged database, which is the heart of our database in the fact that it has native support for all modern data types, analytics, and the latest development paradigms built into one product. So you as a developer, that's a really important concept because the, the biggest benefits of that is data synergy. So it's been able to like do real time, um, you know, for, for example, real time fraud detection inside a transaction or being able to do product recommendation across different different data models, and you can do all that in one transaction and inside the database without having to actually have all these specialized databases that are very, very costly due to the fact that they are sprawling in complexity and they incur a lot of data movement, which can also incur high as charges as well. So today in this session, we'll be specifically focusing on microservices support containers, Kubernetes operator and AI microservices as well. And, you know, we're really hoping to reach developers with 23AI um, for machine critical and all applications. And Paul's going to talk about the Oracle database today to accelerate modern application development with microservices, generative AI, containers, Kubernetes, and other innovations bringing open source and Oracle database closer. Next slide, please, Paul. So in this use case, we're very excited to talk to you about a food delivery application. And Paul's going to be covering that in quite a lot of detail and how we can actually architect this, like I said, in a full stack development from end to end. Take it away, please, Paul. All right. Thank you so much, Suzanne and Tammy. <laughs> um, I love talking about this topic. And uh, it, it's such a great point, too, about the difference between on the journey <laughs> of on-prem and cloud and how that does actually affect applications. So I'm gonna, going to kind of um, start right from Kubernetes um, because when we talk about microservices, 
Actually, you don't necessarily need Kubernetes for microservices. Microservices, the the original and you know pure one line definition, is uh, simply breaking apart your um, application, <laughs> excuse me, into bounded contexts that are decoupled. And so that means it, I kind of joke because this is the way we were all supposed to program anyway, right? It's along the bounded context not having intertwined logic, having them decoupled. And so if you have more than one process, you are using microservices, okay? It doesn't need to be Netflix with a thousand microservices. <clears throat> it's just the fact that there is some decoupling in multiple processes, you know, multiple services in your application, okay? And so the history of Kubernetes, and I'll, I'll bring up this next slide here as I give the quick history, is simply, you know, everyone was using way back, whenever that was in the 90s, started using Docker images to have these, um, you know, um, environments that are controlled and consistent. So there was such a, a mass use of these containers that there needed to be something to really orchestrate them um, and optimize on that architecture. And that's what a group in Google did when they created Kubernetes. So. That is, you know, there's so much content. Um, but when you think of modernization of applications, you generally think of microservices. I've been talking about microservices for about six years now. So it's been around and it's no longer the, the new thing per se, although most people are early on in their in their journey of, with microservices. Um, but it's a very, you know, tried and true, you know, already architecture just after these past few years. Um, but um, what that's why we're picking Kubernetes as this development example, because Kubernetes runs on all the different clouds. As I mentioned, Google invented it. So obviously it's running on GKE, as Suzanne mentioned. Um, so it's a, you know, it's a great place to start. It's very um, uh, popular. And so I'm not going to go super deep into Kubernetes, but in reality, it's a pretty basic setup. And there are a number of different resources. And I kind of mention uh, the, the really key ones on the left here. So the first one is your deployment. And all your deployment is, is just a YAML description of your microservice. So it's, it's you're mentioning where the container is in your container re, uh, repo. And then you're, um, you know, just giving other information as far as how many replicas. So that's how much, how many instances of that, um, you know, uh, container you want running. So that's the great thing about Kubernetes is it automatically scales up and down. Um, you know, it orchestrates the full orchestration, scales up and down, has health probes. So you can, you know, liveliness and readiness of your container, things like that. Really, you know, really nice services so you can um, take care of all these cross-cutting concerns, security and everything else, and make your microservice just that, just business logic. That's the you know end of the day goal. So the deployment is just describing that, it's describing your service. The um, service resource in Kubernetes is the um, really you know beautiful network abstraction. So in your deployment, you front your deployments with a service, and that service is not, you know, a, a, a IPs. It's a um, mapping of names, and so the network underneath can be changing, but you don't need to change your service. So this was a big thing we learned with service-oriented architecture. SOA is, you know, this decoupling at every possible layer. So the service is really something that made Kubernetes. That abstraction made Kubernetes very popular, and so you can, you know do things like go from a node port or a cluster IP to a load balancer without changing your application or deployment, et cetera. Okay, so really nice. The pod is your runtime uh, of your deployment. So as I said, you had your deployment with a container. You say you want three instances of that deployment. That means you will get three pods. So the pod is your actual runtime of that container. It's what Kubernetes is firing up, okay? And then wallet, I just mentioned, um, it, 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 actually it's um, in Kubernetes, it's called a secret. And that's where you would keep information such as your wallet um, for credentials. Now, 
since then, I bring it up because it's important, obviously, that, you know, the, the credential or connection information is important, but there have actually become more secure ways of doing that uh, where we don't actually use Kubernetes secrets. <laughs> but I just bring that up because that's the point of the secret. So if you see it, but now we have, um, and, you know, we, we have, by the way, an Azure DevOps workshop, a Live Labs workshop that shows this, but there are more secure mechanisms where you go to an abstraction of config, which goes to a vault, whether that's, you know, OCI is your, whatever the case may be. So that's the security. And along with that, there are service accounts. Okay. So you get the idea. There are these constructs. Um, and then you use the, uh, um, the CLI, which is kubectl to do things like kubectl, you know, scale deployment. And so it's actually, you know, once you know those basics, you're really rolling with Kubernetes. It's not quite so difficult. Okay. And so all the clouds have Kubernetes implementations, as I mentioned, that's why we're going with that. Um, another resource that uh, Kubernetes has is the operator. So just about every major database or messaging system or whatever the case may be has an operator. And that operator kind of, as the name suggests, takes over, uh, automates what an admin would have to do. And so we have a very robust uh, Kubernetes operator for the Oracle database been out for a couple of years now. And the long and short of that is it'll manage the life cycle of your database, whether it's container database or, you know, autonomous, whatever it may be. Obviously the different databases have different properties to them, but that's the concept. You install this um, with one line, this Kubernetes operator for Oracle database, and it will take care of, you know, those life cycle operations for your patching, et cetera. Okay. So let's get into uh, microservice use cases. We have this workshop uh, for microservices, uh, um, very popular workshop because it covers a lot of topics and it really shows, it really is, the Oracle database is just so perfect for microservices because um, as Suzanne was mentioning, the part of the, some of the advantage, you know, and disadvantage of microservices, I guess, is the fact that each microservice is, you know, that insular encapsulated um, service. So you can have different teams working on it, different data types, you know, all these different, and they're not coupled together. Um, but if you're using a different database for JSON, relational, spatial, graph, whatever the case may be, it becomes, a, you know, a nightmare to manage it. And you don't get the efficiencies. You'll see base, basically half of this presentation is on data driven microservices and transaction processing, uh, because that's one of the hardest problems. It, it is the hardest problem in data in um, microservices. You know, most people will agree uh, that's one of the trickier problems. And so the transactionality, in addition to all the different workload support, data type support, all the AI in the database, you know, all this stuff I really can't go too deep into. Uh, name, you know, name that, whatever it is that I, I just mentioned, and you can do it transactionally with other aspects. So if you're doing spatial, JSON, or relational, not only can you do them in the same uh, database, take care of all and take advantage of the HA and admin of having it in the same uh, converged multi-purpose Oracle database, but you can have transactionality across them. And, and I actually get into that a bit more when I talk about messaging as well. So this workshop we have, uh, Simplifying Microservices, you know, shows off this aspect, shows off the fact that, you know, um, it's an online store. So you have the classic order inventory service. They're using JSON and relational. They're talking with messaging. We have a pairing. It's a, um, you know, it's a food delivery service called GrabDish, kind of like a um, uh, Uber Eats or whatever ripoff. <laughs> And so we have delivery is shown with spatial to show that off. And then, you know, we, a lot of these features, which is great too, have been in the database for so long, you know, way before microservices, but they fit into the microservices world perfectly. So right down to the portable database architecture. So the, the most pure microservice model says each service should have its own database. And the real point of that is again this isolation and decoupling I mentioned. So one, you know, one database per service is the that can be done purely as I, as I say, 
one database per service. But as long as there is separation, uh, many um, implementations I see now will do it even just at the schema level, just to have that separation. But my point is you have all these options with the Oracle database. And the fact that we have these PDBs, um, you know, the, the match is so perfect with microservices. You know, you can have a PDB per microservice, but still have the underlying architecture of the, the container database. So it's, it's, you know, it's great for microservices. I guess I made my point there. Um, this is just uh, when you're, when you're going about modernizing your application and you're setting up these boundaries for microservices, as I say, that's the biggest uh, attribute of microservices. The, you know, you're, you need to decouple the app and the data layer. And generally the data layer is maybe a little trickier because there has been this cross communication, you know, it hasn't been decoupled. And so we do have this tool um, that shows usages and, you know, can help you break out these bounded contexts. And so this is an example of that tool for the uh, workshop where it shows, you know, this is order activities using this schema or whatever the case may be. And then you can start to tease them out. And the, the nice thing about microservices in many cases, you know, people are not starting from greenfields. They're, they're going one step of the way, what, you know, step by step with their existing app and adding AI and other functionality in. Uh, you can tease these services out. So as I mentioned, if you have two services, it's microservices. And so a lot of people, and WebLogic is a good example. They have a they have an operator. You're deploying WebLogic. You can with that operator, you can deploy WebLogic in um, Kubernetes, and then you're adding you know a cell phone front end, and that's your second service. Uh, uh, you know, just an example out of the air. Um, but that is that is a common case, and so then you're just teasing out one part or adding one part. You can um, take your legacy app and form what's called an anti-corruption layer, which is you know exposing certain interfaces so that you can then refactor out the code um, to create your microservices. So it doesn't need to be this, and it shouldn't be. <laughs> and all at once, you know, just um, sh schema shredding. Uh, type exercise. There are patterns for this. Okay. Um, yep. So now I'm going to get into some of the features of the Oracle database that really facilitate these harder problems for data-driven and event-driven microservices. Um, and I'll I'll go fairly quickly, but this uh, this may be um, in my mind is really the most powerful or one of the most powerful features and very fundamental to microservices, okay? And it's another great one for the database because it's been in the database for decades, okay? And what it comes down to is with microservices, especially when you're coming closer to data, more and more it, it lends itself to using message-driven or event-driven communication. So one thing that you know, you're adding with microservices is more network communication. If you're having more processes, you're having more inter-process communication. And so you do introduce network no matter how reliable it is, um, you know, something can happen with the communication. Um, and so with microservices, you know, just fundamentally, you're trying to do two things. You're trying to change data and then communicate the change of that data to another microservice, right? So two operations, and I've been in the, I've been doing transaction processing for over 25 years now. So, you know, that at least for me, that rings the atomicity, you know, <laughs> whistle or bell or whatever. Uh, you know, if one of those goes wrong, then you have to account for it. So if you were, if you changed data and the message did not go out, then you have to worry about sending message again, and you have to worry about, okay, did I send duplicate messages, right? And, you know, likewise, the message was received, but the data was not inserted after the message was received. That's the issues that, those are the issues that um, developers have to deal with, right? And, and they would rather be doing their business logic, but instead they're coding to this, you know, uh, making item potent consumers to handle duplicate message delivery and things like that. And so that's that's the the task or the chore if you're doing something like Kafka, Postgres, Mongo, right? 
But in the Oracle database, we've actually had a messaging engine, as I say, for decades now. And because it's in the same resource manager, it's in the same database, we were able to optimize the architecture so that you can do messaging and data operations in the same local transaction, not the XA transaction, you know, not, you don't need the extra transaction manager and logs and things like that, the same local transaction. So as I say, that makes it tremendously advantageous to the developer. And in some of these cases, you simply can't handle it. It's, you're, it's not just the developer, it's the admin will have to step in uh, to reconcile things. So very quickly, um, just real quickly, the flow of the application here, and this is a fairly common one. The order service receives an order, inserts it, sends a message to the inventory service. Inventory service uh, picks up the message, adjusts the inventory, and sends the status of the inventory back to the order service. Order service gets that uh, message and then persists the you know, final order state. So looking at the most complicated part of that, the inventory service, it's receiving the message from the order service, manipulating the, the inventory in the database, and then sending a message back three operations. If there's a failure in any of those spots, the Oracle database and this transactional event queue messaging in the database will take care of it for you. And if you're not using that, it won't be taken care of. And that's very unique to the Oracle database. That's why I want to spend some time on that. Okay. I'm just going to very quickly go through this, these next couple features. Um, this, this one, uh, again, this is very much related to microservices and data or transaction processing. So there's a new feature in 23AI uh, called Loctus Reservations. And it's actually a spec implemented that was written back in the 80s um, by Dieter Gallick at, at Oracle that um, is now in 23AI. So it's pretty awesome to see. So the best way to describe it is to compare and contrast it to other locking mechanisms like pessimistic and optimistic, okay? So like I say, I'll go through this very quickly. Pessimistic, this is your select for update. One transaction at a time, super safe, uh, but slow because it's serial access, right? Then we have optimistic locking. This is where you're keeping track of changes um, so that you can have concurrent transactions, uh, but you need, you know, you're tracking who updated last on the data, and then also older transactions will lose if you know newer transactions have come in and taken the inventory. So now we have this escrow locking or lock-free reservations, and uh, this is kind of um, the best of both worlds. And the way it's achieved is that we use this intermediary journal. So you're working against this journal and the journal is giving out um, promises or reservations, thus the word. And so it's giving out these reservations to transactions, but, um, but it's keeping it in this journal. And the second aspect of the architecture, it's the journal and the fact that you are operating um, at, the at the field level. So as far as you're implementing it, you're just putting a new reservable keyword on that field and you're acting just on that field and you're acting against a journal. So you can get this um, concurrency, but older transactions don't lose, okay? And now that I bring that up because that's uh, an aspect in microservices, as I mentioned, inventory is the example used in this use case we're talking about. You, they generally have these hotspots on inventory, right? And so that's a number increment, decrement, increment, decrement. And so this works perfectly for that scenario. And we actually, the journal is a byproduct for distributed transactions um, in the, that we use in the database. So that's the next topic, right? And this is probably the, I said, you know, data is some of the, the trickier aspects of microservices. Distributed transactions across microservices is, is maybe the most difficult of those difficult problems, right? And that's why we focus on these. And that's why I put these to the forefront. I'm talking about the, the harder problems that we've, you know, we really have solved. And um, that's, you can tell I'm excited about it because this, this feature is really, all these features are just so great for microservice developers because it takes that, you know, the mystery and burden away um, from them. So the problem with distributed transactions across microservices is that we have, as I say, more network, more participants that are separated by network. And so using two-phase commit and XA 
may not always be possible. If you have a very controlled environment, it's still possible in Kubernetes and microservices to use two-phase and XA. But if you're using more and more services and more network and maybe disparate services that are um, you know, not your, your, under your control, that type of thing, then those, those XA and two-phase commit protocols um, will not be feasible because they use locks, right? They use distributed locks. If those locks are held open, that is going to be a problem. You're going to get the lock held by in-dial transaction error and things like that. So then you're, um, you know, that restricts you to local transactions and it brings about the popularity of sagas, which is a spec that was also written in the eighties and the most popular, um, uh, the sagas is actually a paper and the most popular and well-defined specification is LRA long running actions. And so basically the flow is the same as your traditional transaction where a transaction at some service is starting a transaction. It's starting to a, talking to a coordinator, which is the same idea as a transaction manager. So start it talks to participants here. I have the classic bank transfer. Those participants enlist themselves in the transaction and then you either commit or roll back. Right. But the big difference is when you're using these distributed, these older, um, uh, algorithms, protocols, rather, um, you are talking directly to the resource manager. So they're holding those in doubt locks that I mentioned. And when you tell them to commit a rollback, they've been doing the bookkeeping. Um, and so they can take care of it cleanly for you. If you're working with only local transactions, that burden is put on the developer to write compensating logic for the rollback case, right? And that is extremely error prone and time consuming. That's, it's estimated 80% of your time is spent writing that compensation logic because you can see you have to bookkeep the way the database would have done it for you. You have to bookkeep that yourself. And then you have to have the logic to do all the unwinding in the case of rollback or compensate. Um, and then, you know, what happens if some failure happens when you compensate, things like that. So what we have uh, is a Saga engine uh, and we have one that actually runs in Kubernetes and one that runs in the database. And I don't, I don't have that much time to go into so much on the differences, but one of the big advantages of the one that runs in the database is it takes care of all of this for you. And it does so by reusing this journal I just mentioned. So you see how this journal is keeping track of all the changes um, being made. So it's keeping track just the way an in doubt uh, table would keep track of your changes, but it's not using those distributed locks. So when it comes time to compensate, your code simply calls uh, rollback or compensate, as I say, same thing, basically. Um, and the database has kept track of it. So you don't have to worry about that 80%. That's what I mean. That's why I spend some time on this. You can imagine that's just a lot of time and a lot of things that can go wrong. So just... There and there are more transaction features. There's so many features in 23 AI that are, you know, just perfect for microservices, but that's a big one I like to bring up. Last topic is observability, because you're with microservices, you're going to need it. <laughs> and we have very unique um one-of-a-kind features in this area too. So observability is metrics, logs, and tracing. And so we Everything we do, uh, this is across Oracle. So I talk to all the observability teams across Oracle, even though I, I focus on the database, of course. Everything conforms to the open uh, telemetry standard. So anything in CNCF, the Cloud Native Compute Foundation, is you know is a standard for modernizing your application. So that's always the, you know the golden standard, and that's where Kubernetes is, and that's where open telemetry is. So what we have are exporters for metrics, logs, and tracing. And what's cool about these is you define what metrics, logs, and tracing you want using SQL. So you can get down to more detail than any other like exporter because you have the, the power of, you know, everything in SQL. So if you just want this field from the alert log that, you know, for this application, for this error, you know, you can get just really precise, whatever SQL you want. And then I talk a little bit more just about the tracing, because this is a unique one of the metrics, logs, and tracing observability pillars. Tracing is a bit unique because with tracing, 
you need to trace the call through the system. So you need to propagate an ID where logs and tracing, you can just, you know, dump it all together and sort it out. Tracing is unique in that aspect. And so what you will see in all of these other, using other databases, is that there's an observe the the DevOps guy has an observability window, and there's always look for it if, after this presentation. It always stops at the database. There's always a node. It's like okay, it's, uh, Kubernetes application, then it hits the database, and that's the end. All right. What's different is that we have now implemented in twenty three AI a trace exporter in the database, so you can. Um, propagate and see the calls all the way into the database and then aspects in the database, okay? So this one slide, this one simple slide here kind of sums it up where you can see on the right-hand side that it's tracing, you know, and this could be from the cell phone into Kubernetes, you know, truly end-to-end. -end. It's tracing and you can see the call into the database. You can see the network call that's between these two arrows here and the time spent in the database, and then you can drill into what happened in the database as well. So all in one console, not multiple consoles where you're dragging IDs and stuff like that back and forth. And then I always like to joke, you know, the old, uh, the old scenario is the app developer blames the database developer for performance, and then the database developer and the app developer just agree to, to blame the network, right? Because it's this nebulous network. <laughs> But this slide, we can see exactly who's to blame. And indeed, it was, we were right. It was the network in this case. <laughs> so, but anyway, that's very powerful. That's when DevOps people see that, they're impressed. And so, just very quickly, we have our own tools. Of course, OCI APM has the logic and AI in it, but this is Grafana open source um, as an example. So, from right to left, metrics, logs, tracing. See something in metrics, double click, it brings you to logs. Again, you're seeing the app tier and the database tier in each of these panels. So you're seeing Kubernetes and the database statistics on the right, the metrics. Drill down to the logs, the logs by time across the two tiers are shown. Then you can click on that Jaeger, it, it detects there's a trace and you see the trace end to end there. And just um, I'll mention there's a backend service for microservices. If you're using Spring Boot's very popular. Um, this will lay it down. It's in the marketplace. You can go and double click and it lays down the most common microservice components, you know, to make it easier. And they provide support and things like that. So it also has plugins for the AI uh, aspects in 23 AI. And finally, that same workshop that has the online store there's also an open source video game just to show another use case, right? The online store is probably the most popular use case ever. And then I just put a video game in there um, that actually runs, you shoot these targets and it takes down Kubernetes microservices in the back end, just as a, you know, a fun use case. We use these as conferences and things, and this is the architecture for that. So I went over and I rambled, but uh, that that is actually the short story um, and I really appreciate your time. So I'll, I'll hand it back to Suzanne to go over the resources here. Thank you so much, Paul. No rambling whatsoever. It was very oh, clear, you. very nice presentation. Thank you. Absolutely. So uh, we've put together just a couple of links. Uh, the do documentation is very important because it takes you through exactly how to deploy Oracle Database at Azure and at Google, respectively. And there's a couple of live labs as well that you can also find on our live website, which all of these uh, contain links to. So when we make the PowerPoint available, you'll be able to click on these. And those live labs, for example, is uh, getting started with Oracle Database at Azure, as well as simplifying Microsoft services with the converged Oracle Database. And the GitHub repo for the pods of con that Paul just showed you is also available. So if you want to dive into that, you can access that on GitHub. And we've also included a link for the database 23 AI feature highlights that I mentioned earlier at the start of the presentation. So I'll hand it over to Tammy now, who's just gonna close off for us. Thanks, Tammy. Thanks so much, Suzanne. And thank you so much, Paul. That was very informative. So thank you so much for that. Um, so uh, uh, as I put in the chat, I will be um, at, 
exporting this uh, PowerPoint into PDF, you'll be able to click on these links. We'll upload them into the Ask Tom landing page as well. So hopefully this was great information for you. Unfortunately, we didn't have any questions. I guess you answered everybody's questions quite well, Paul and Suzanne. So we didn't have any questions at this time. So I guess I want to thank everybody for joining us today. We really appreciate you coming every month uh, to listen to the multi-cloud happenings. Um, if you have some more information that you would like to see, we would love to, oh, well, thank you for the hearts. We love that. Uh, if you have any, inf any topics that you would like to see uh, brought to you, we would love to bring those to you as well. Um, all right. With that, I think I'll close this out for October. And the next time we'll see each other is in November. And until then, have a great month, everybody. And we look forward to talking to you soon. Thank you again. Bye now. Thanks, everyone. Bye now. Yeah.